Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark Cards bring you John Hodiak in Standish of Standish on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories and presents as your host one of the most distinguished actors of the American theater, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Lionel Barrymore. Since this is the beginning of Thanksgiving week, we of Hallmark Playhouse thought you might like to hear the story of a man who took part in that first Thanksgiving day upon these American shores. To do this, we've adapted Jane G. Austen's fine book called Standish of Standish. I'm sure most of us remember Captain Miles Standish for his legendary courtship of Priscilla. But as a matter of fact, his whole life was a romantic adventure. I think you'll enjoy hearing about it. And to star in the role of a brave captain tonight, we are happy to have that excellent actor, John Hodiak. And now, here's Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you choose the Christmas cards that will carry your warm wishes across the miles, here's something to remember. Hallmark Christmas cards cost no more. Yet you can always find a Hallmark card that's a perfect reflection of your feelings of friendship, of your own good taste. That's why that Hallmark on the back is always a welcome addition to your thoughtfulness. For it tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture Plymouth Adventure, starring Spencer Tracy, Gene Tierney, Van Johnson, and Leo Ginn. And now here is the first act of Standish of Standish, starring John Hodiak. He stands alone on the hilltop, looks out to sea. His bearing, his erect and proud, as becomes a soldier who has fought so gallantly against the Spanish in far-off Holland. Captain Miles Standish shields his eyes with a sun-browned hand and gazes intently across the waters of Plymouth Harbor, across the calm Massachusetts Bay, to the open sea and the dark silhouette upon it. Aye, it bears this way. Be it friend or foe, it's long since sight of any ship upon these empty waters. How long? Many months, even perhaps a year. And yet must a man always measure time by the hourglass and calendar? Is it easier to say that scarce two years have passed since we of the Mayflower drifted about upon that same horizon? Or to say it happened 50 lives ago? Aye, for there were 50 more lives among us that December night when we gathered in desperate council. Every man except captain and crew was in the main cabin that night. This much we know, sirs. The merchant company which sent us to found a colony in Virginia has entrusted us all to a traitorous captain. Aye, we'll never see Virginia. Captain Jones has taken Dutch gold to cast us away on this barren coast. Call him not Captain Michalden, but a buccaneer and a slaver. That was his former calling. Gentlemen, gentlemen, a word. I, Captain Standish. Anger is not our remedy. We can't forever coast along these shores. There's little food and too much scurvy. We must make a landing and begin our colony. We've made landings, Captain, and found no worthy spot. True, and been greeted by arrows and howling savages. And so we must look farther. Tonight I've talked to our pilot, and he remembers a likely harbor. 
He's willing to guide us there. And perhaps to an Indian ambush. It is possible, sir. For the savages do well to hate us. Other white men have come here to capture their people and sell them into Spanish slavery. Still, we must risk it. Well, gentlemen, what think you of our friend's advice? You, John Alden. Captain Standish is our military commander. We have voted our lives under the protection of his sword. Wherever we may go, he will not fail us. Well spoken, well spoken. Then it is decided. And may Providence smile upon our efforts. Captain Standish. Captain Standish, sir. I may. A word, most urgently. Then, gentlemen, if you will pardon me. And now, Priscilla, what causes you to interrupt the council? Your wife, Captain. Mistress Rose is stricken ill. So it was that the first warning came to me. An illness of which Rose made light and which I did not yet fear. There was work to be done and my worries were of it. The pilot had told of a harbor and a handsome beach... But before we dared land the women and children, his story must be proved by exploration. And so the next day, the ship's longboat was provisioned and 18 of us set forth into the face of an icy gale. Sleep cut its mark across face and hands and crusted on our iron helmets and breastplates. The wind rose higher, and in one terrible moment, rudder and sail and mast carried away. And then there were only the oars and our own strong arms. The first land we made was an island, but still a refuge. And with the passing of the storm, we found ourselves in the midst of a landlocked harbor. We rowed toward the shore with better spirits than in many a moon. Look yonder, sirs. That great gray rock standing forth from the surf. Aye, stay for it, lads. Let it be our stepping stone to the land. How say you, Captain? An excellent spot, Master Bradford. All things appear excellent. The open field stretching down to the beach. That high hill beyond where I may set my cannon and make a fortress. Excellent, gentlemen. And familiar. Familiar, you say? Aye. This harbor bears likeness to Captain John Smith's map. He christened such a place as this. Plymouth. Plymouth. The port from which we sail. And now the name of our new home. Plymouth. In our new England. Stand by, sirs. The rock. Jump onto it, lads, and make us fast. <laughs> Upon this rock I seize this land and lay claim to it. For the glory of our sovereign lord, James, King of England, France, and Ireland. Near by that rock, we planted our colony, began our fortress and cabins and common house. Snow and ice slowed the work, and sickness brought it to a halt. Of our 101, only seven of us had strength to nurse the ill and bury the dead. At first, they went by ones and twos, and then by tens. And with them, she went, the rose of my life. John Alden and I buried her here upon this hilltop. Come away, Miles. It's not good to linger. One moment more, John. Count them. The graves, I'm weary of counting them. They number almost 50. Aye. And give fair warning to the Indians that we grow weaker and they ever stronger. Strong enough to attack. That's true. I've seen them skulking about the woods. They watch and wait. And we must give them something to watch. With the first thaw, we must plow this field and plant corn in it. What, you'd have us destroy our graveyard? We must, before its presence destroys us. Miles, signal gun. Aye, they want us in the settlement. Let us go. It was Priscilla Moline who had caused the signal gun to be fired. We found her waiting in the doorway of her father's cabin. She was weeping. Go in, Captain. My father would speak to you. Why, there is still time. But what of John? We were told that he also was wanted. He is. Stay here with me, John. I feel to be alone. Captain Standish. Aye, Master Moline. I grieve for your loss these days. Such a loss as soon my daughter will have in me. May it not come to pass, sir. It will. First mother and brother, and now it is to be me. 
A mad cast entirely alone in this crude wilderness. Has she no kin in her native France? France is far away, my son. You are needed. Master Moline. Watch over my daughter. Keep her from harm. See that she marries soon, then I believe. I shall do all that I can, sir. Thank you. Captain Standish. Aye. If, despite my request, there be any else who has better claim to your protection. There is one, sir. Barbara. Barbara? We were friends in childhood, and our families are somewhat kin. It is my hope to do well here and to send her a dowry and a chance for marriage. That is my only promise, except that which I've given you. God bless you, Captain. God bless you. <laughs> That night, William Moline was no more. For his daughter, I found shelter with the family of Elder Brewster. And for myself, I sought the company of young John Alden. Together, we lived and worked and waited for the coming of spring. And with it came fresh alarm. Captain! Captain! An Indian is among us. I see him, Master Bradford. But he comes alone. One lone savage wandering curiously from cabin to cabin. But still an Indian, sir. Perhaps a spy will take a report to a thousand others. Whatever he be, let us receive him kindly. That all may know we are peaceful men. Aye, and to prove it, I shall welcome him myself. So it was that the Indian, Samoset, came to Plymouth. A red savage who spoke our own language. Somerset learn white man talk when white men come in ships to fish. English fishing vessels have come to Cape Cod. Many summer ago. I see. Then you are white man's friend. White man give food, smoke, pipe with Somerset? We have little food left from the winter, but you shall have your share. White man have much food. Plant corn. Aye, but the soil is poor. The corn does not grow. Indian no way. Indian plant corn, fish in ground together. Make grow good. Summer said show, white man. After Samoset came other Indians, both to trade and to show us their ways with the soil. We bought the furs which they brought us and their bundles of sassafras roots and loaded the cargo aboard the Mayflower. Then finally the day came when the ship made ready to sail. Governor Bradford called us together in the common house. Gentlemen, in yonder harbor floats the last link with a world we once called our own. When the tide is full, that link will break. Now is your time, my friends. Now is the time to think the last of that olden home or to go back to her. Hold not back, gentlemen. One or all may quit these shores and no disgrace. How say you? Governor Bradford. Aye, Captain Standish. It is true that we left the old world with high hopes for a better future. The pleasanter life of Virginia was our goal, and we were cheated of it. That is very true, we were. We sought a place where our families might grow and put down roots. But now our families are swept from us, all but a few. Therefore, I say... Yet still, I say... We chose a right when we cast off the old world and its old ways. We've come to find a new world with new ways, better ways. We came on a pilgrimage to found a new life. That life is here, waiting for us to make of it what we will. And I, for one, cannot and will not turn away from the task. Just a moment, we will return to the second act of Standish of Standish, starring John Hodiak. As I was making out my Christmas card list the other day, this thought occurred to me. Christmas comes twice a year. For you know, the first joy of Christmas is in giving, a joy that comes the moment we start planning how to make someone else happy. And making someone happy is much simpler than we often think it is. Thoughtfulness, not cost, is the key. 
That's why at Christmas you'll see so many people selecting an individual Hallmark card for everyone on their list. They have found one way to make their family and friends happy at Christmas. At fine stores everywhere you'll find there are Hallmark Christmas cards with special heartwarming messages. Christmas cards you'll want to send because they express your sentiments so beautifully. Say something you want to say, just the way you want to say it. There are Hallmark Christmas cards for each member of your family, for your neighbors, your family doctor, a man in the armed services, your minister, and many others. Each card carries your Christmas thoughts in a very special way. It's as if you were there in person saying, I selected this card especially for you for Christmas. And of course, the hallmark on the back of each Christmas card you choose adds its own message of thoughtfulness. It says, you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to Lionel Barrymore in the second act of Standish of Standish, starring John Hodiak. From the lonely hilltop, Captain Miles Standish gazes out over Plymouth Harbor toward the unknown sailing vessel which bears ever nearer. As he watches the strange sail, his mind sees again another ship, the Mayflower. Much as we hated the sight of that ugly, leaky, plague-ridden craft, we felt, all of us, that twinge of homesickness when it up-anchored and disappeared into the east. With her went a most precious cargo, our letters to friends and kin in old England. It was soon after the Mayflower sailed that Governor Bradford engaged me in a private and most serious talk, and after which I, in turn, went to young John Alden. You must pardon me, Miles, but I catch not your meaning. Then I'll put it bluntly. You and I, John, and several more, are single men. For our colony's sake, we should be family men. Oh, if you mean to marry... And I will. If the maiden will have me. If she will have you, there can be no if. Lucky would any girl be to call herself Mr. Standish. Think you such a girl as Priscilla Moline? Priscilla? I owe her protection. And with your help, she'll receive it of me. With my help? I've lived too long a soldier's life. I've little of the lover's turn of speech. But you, John, you know the maid well. You visited her often, and now you will again, to woo her in my name and win her for my name. But, Miles... Lad, I... do not look so stricken. Your task is strange, but in it, you help a staunch friend. When shall Priscilla hear your suit? Tonight. Tonight I stand sentry, and there bring me report. Hi, John. Tell me, quickly. How did she receive you? Courteously. Kindly. You, uh, you told her of my suit? Carefully and fully. And her word? Her word, man, her word. It was, uh, it was nay. Nay? Still, she may yet change her mind. Tomorrow night, John, you will go again. No, 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 I cannot. Cannot? Think, Miles. Why is it that Priscilla and I are so often together... Why did I shrink from tonight's embarrassment? You love her. With all my soul. For no other man would I step aside. Be my friend, but do not ask me to plead your suit. Well. <laughs> oh, Miles, do not lie. It is but at myself. Here is the proof of my words. I've lived too long a soldier's life. So many thoughts of war and of the defense of this colony have filled my mind and blinded me to the signs of love in my own best friend. Then you hold it not against me? No, lad. For now I understand Priscilla's answer. She says me nay, that she may say you I. She's yours, John. Wed the maid, and with a loser's blessing. The summer passed, and the autumn came with full harvest and a peaceful colony. And so it was that we set aside a day and a week 
for thanksgiving to the merciful providence which watched over us. There was feasting and sport and hospitality to all the Indians round about. And now soon another year will end. And soon a second time for Thanksgiving. Captain Standish, your attendance, please. Aye, Master Bradford. While you wander upon this hill, the village grows restless and craves your orders. What orders, sir? Concerning yonder ship. It draws into the harbor, and we know not if to greet it as friend or foe. Nor I, sir. Which is why I stand here waiting. Cannon. Is it in salute or pirate attack? Look close. The flag flutters to the masthead. It's red. The colors of England. Then to the beach quickly and let us welcome their first boat. sends me to fetch you. He asks you to join him and greet the master of the good ship, Anne. Gladly, if we may push through this maze of newcomers. A wonderful sight, are they not? Aye. Sixty-nine new colonists to double our strength. New faces were never more welcome. And welcome, I hope, sir. Even an old, new face. Bob. <laughs> it's been long, Miles. Have I changed too badly? Barbara. <laughs> you proved you know my name. <laughs> But have you no other greeting? Aye. And now there's true cause for rejoicing. <laughs> ah, Barbara, what a celebration we shall have. Captain Standish. Aye, Master Bradford. We'll keep the ship's master waiting no longer. The ship's master was but an excuse to call you. Follow me quickly, ma'am. I like not the look on your face, Master Bradford. No, will you like better the news? And now it's this. The redskin Somerset came to me in the crowd and whispered of war. Indian War. Then it's come at last. I've known there were mutterings and fear of our growing strength. The sight of today's ship has fanned the blaze. Aye, but there's added worry. The tribes know you, Captain, to be our defense. And so Chief Pexuat has sworn your death by his own hand. And to that oath, I must make the same answer. I'll seek him out in his own forest. No, Captain. It may be your murder. Better that, sir, than to cower here and so invite the murder of all Plymouth. at this late hour? A soldier that returns from the wilderness. Miles! Oh, Miles, you're alive. And did you doubt it, Barbara? I feared sadly, for the colony had no word from you these many days. But wait, your arm. A wound, no more. And less than Pexuat received. He's dead? Dead. And there will be no war. Oh, thanks be to heaven. For peace, Barbara, for my safe return. No, this time, I'll not ask another to say the words that are my privilege. Come, Barbara, forget the hour. The night is warm, and we'll walk in it. Miles. I. I dreamed a dream another night. I saw you wounded and lying feverish in the forest. And so I was, after the Indian's blade found me. It was a fever as real as life, and as true I saw us in it. You and me, as in years gone by. You, a child in an English garden, and I already a soldier. A soldier too old to speak his heart to a child too young. A soldier who went away to Holland in the battlefield. He made her one promise only, to send a dowry for her wedding someday. That, too, was clear in my feverish dream. And then another girl, much older... I loved her with a different love, and it died with her. And then in my fever, I saw another face, the face of past happiness, smiling here upon this wilderness coast. And there, there the fever ended. I woke and wondered what power on earth had drawn you across that stormy water. Oh, Miles. Miles, can't you see? The only dowry I've wanted through all these years is the love of the soldier who went away. Then you have it now, and for all time to come. My love, my dear. And added to it, 
a richer dowry than any maids beyond these shores. This new land, this new world, it waits here all around us, for us and our children, to touch it into life, to tame it with the ax, to make it fertile with the plow, to build with God's blessing a nation among nations. John Hodiak and Lionel Barrymore will return in a moment. Have you seen the exciting new Hallmark Christmas card sleigh and Hallmark Christmas card train that everyone's talking about? They're those wonderful Christmas cards that are really Christmas gifts because they can be set up in a jiffy to display all the other cards your friends receive. And when they're placed on the mantel or window ledge or hall table, there'll be happy reminders all season long of your thoughtfulness and your warm wishes. The Hallmark train is a merry little train with red and white peppermint striped wheels, box cars, an engine, and a red caboose. And the Hallmark sleigh looks just like Santa's magical sleigh pulled by all his prancing reindeer. Best of all, these clever Christmas cards cost just one dollar each, complete with mailing envelopes at the fine stores which feature Hallmark cards. And here's a tip. Be sure to get an extra Hallmark sleigh or Hallmark train to brighten up your own house this Yule time. You'll know them by that hallmark and crown, the same symbol you always look for on the back of a card when you care enough to send the very best. Here again is Lionel Barrymore. Thank you, John Hodiak, for a magnificent Miles Standish. It was a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Barrymore. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this is the second appearance of a member of the Hodiak family on Hallmark Playhouse. Your beautiful wife, Ann Baxter, was our star a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and believe me, it's always a pleasure to see her, you know. <laughs> well, Mr. Barrymore, <laughs> Ann certainly enjoys being on Hallmark Playhouse as much as I do. By the way, just a couple of nights ago, Ann was reading the Hallmark card story of Christmas in an Envelope in the new issue of Cornette. And you'd have thought she discovered Christmas cards for the first time she was so interested in. <laughs> well, I, I can well imagine that, John. You know, Christmas cards are like so many personal visits from friends, multiplied many times over. That's why the story of how they started is so interesting. There's also quite a fascinating story on the same subject in the December issue of Living for Young Homemakers, which tells the story of how Hallmark fostered great art as a means of expressing our Christmas wishes. I'll be sure to get a copy, Mr. Barrymore. Thanks for telling me about it. Ah. Now, what story are you going to have on Hallmark Playhouse next week? Well, next week our story will be dramatized from the historical novel by Bruce Lancaster called The Secret Road, a story of espionage and intrigue that helped America win the Revolutionary War. To star in this exciting story, we shall have Dana Andrews. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Sunday. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our story tonight was adapted by Leonard Sinclair. Until next Sunday, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. John Hodiak is currently appearing in Battle Zone. John Alden was played by Whitfield Connor and Bradford was portrayed by James McCallion. Others in our cast included Virginia Gregg as Priscilla, Loreen Tuttle as Barbara, and Ted DeCorsia as Moline. Every Sunday, Hallmark cards present two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. On radio, the Hallmark Playhouse with host Lionel Barrymore. And on television, outstanding dramatic entertainment on the Hallmark Television Theater. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time, when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Dana Andrews and Bruce Lancaster's The Secret Road, and the week after that, Mildred Cram's Miracle on the Blotter, starring Joan Fontaine, 
And the week after that, Lloyd C. Douglas's Home for Christmas on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.